Today we're exploring a region lock case that's easily one of the darkest I've ever come across. A story that involves a twisted romance, secret identities, a live TV standoff, and new AI cameras that just might end up solving thousands of other gold cases in the near future. This is the tale of Ba Si Ying and Lao Rongqi, China's very own Bonnie and Clyde. Have you ever faced a choice so clear it felt like the universe was giving you a nudge? Like when you spot that dish you've been craving on a menu, or when your favourite artist announces a gig right in your hometown. In the world of business, we're always on the hunt for those no-brainer decisions. The ones that save us time, money, and stress. And that's where today's sponsor, Stamps.com comes in. Imagine having a post office right in your pocket. That's Stamps.com. With just a computer and a printer, you can manage all of your mailing and shipping, hassle-free. They'll even send you a free scale to get started. Whether you're mailing checks, invoices, or even shipping out orders, Stamps.com's got you covered. With the Stamps.com mobile app, you can take care of business anywhere, anytime. No lines, no traffic, no waiting. Selling online? Stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Need supplies? Their supply store's got everything you need, from labels to printers. But my favourite thing about Stamps has to be the unbeatable discounts. We're talking up to 89% off USPS and UPS rates. So join the over 1 million businesses making the no-brainer choice with Stamps. Sign up at stamps.com forward slash lazy masquerade for a four-week trial, free postage, and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Again, that's stamps.com forward slash lazy masquerade. Born into an impoverished Chinese household in 1964, Fa Ying had what can only be described as a rough start in life. He was the youngest of seven siblings, and with his father being a lowly cart driver and his mother a humble tea saleswoman, the family had to live hand to mouth, barely making enough to scrape by. And thankfully, all of the children were industrious, and each of them went on to get steady government jobs in Zhejiang City. All of them, that is, except for Xi Ying. By the mid-1970s, he was the only one still at school, and his grades were poor to say the least. He had little interest in academics, and spent far more time slacking off than studying. An unambitious underachiever, Xi Ying was content to work alongside one of his parents and inherit their trade. But fate had other ideas. It was in 1977, when Xi Ying was just 14 years old, that his father drowned in the Yangtze River after getting caught in a whirlpool. Just a few months later, his mother was paralysed in a car crash. The boy had always lacked discipline and guidance, but with his siblings having now moved out, his father gone, and his mother no longer able to move, Si Ying was left to essentially raise himself. Unfortunately, he soon gave up on education and fell into a life of criminality. In 1981, Xi Ying was sentenced to eight years of labour re-education for robbery, assault, and hooliganism, but was released after serving just three years. In 1985, he found himself behind bars for a second time, this time on a ten-year sentence for robbery and intentional injury. But he was, again, released early in 1989. After this second stint in prison, Xi Ying tried to turn his life around. He became an entrepreneur and married a woman named Miao in 1990. The pair had a daughter the following year. Yet, despite his attempts to lead a normal life, Xi Ying was still widely regarded as a gangster within the Zhejiang community. He adopted the nickname Beru Seven, and was known to be connected with the local triad syndicate. It soon became obvious that an ordinary family life wasn't on the cards for Xi Ying, and less than two years after getting married, he and Miao separated. As part of their agreement, he paid her 85,000 yuan and moved out of their shared home. But as one door closes, another opens, and while attending a friend's wedding in 1993, 28-year-old Si Ying met and fell in love with his true soulmate, an 18-year-old elementary school teacher named Lao Rongji. Unlike Si Ying, 
Rongji had grown up in a relatively well-off household. On paper, the two were complete opposites. Where Zi Ying was lazy, unacademic, and rough around the edges, Rongji was enterprising, highly intelligent, and ladylike. Before they met, Zi Ying had already heard about Rongji. Her delicate features and sunny disposition had made her the talk of the town, and there were plenty of men hoping to catch her eye. Likewise, Rongji had not only heard about Zi Ying, but had become strangely fascinated with his bad boy reputation. She viewed Zi Ying as Zhu Jiang's very own Robin Hood, an outlaw who stole from the rich and gave to the needy, who kept a little something but wasn't greedy, a man who walked on the wild side. That appealed to Rongji. Though her friends and family believed her to be a sensible, kind-hearted, and innocent young woman, secretly she found the monotony of everyday life rather mundane. Though she was still young and had landed herself a decent job, Rongji felt trapped in her life. She had wanted to go to college and achieve great things, but had been dissuaded from doing so by her brother. And now, it felt like every day was just the same thing over and over. It was a fine life. A decent life. A normal life. But in her mind, a boring life. Rongji had long been looking for a little excitement, and figuring that she had found that with Si Ying, she decided to leave the reception with the self-proclaimed troublemaker on his motorbike. It wasn't long before Zi Ying and Rong Qi began a relationship, and for them, romance didn't come cheap. They spent tens of thousands of yuan a month on dates, dates which Zi Ying paid for using triad money. He had officially fallen back into his old criminal ways, something which Rong Qi not only put up with, but actively encouraged. The ultimate example of a good girl gone bad, Rongji ended up leaving her job at the elementary school and chose to help her new boyfriend rob innocent townspeople to pay for their lavish lifestyle. Her life certainly wasn't boring anymore, that was for sure. On a swelteringly hot summer's evening in 1996, Zi Ying got into a dispute with members of a rival syndicate, during which he ended up harpooning one of them. Knowing that there would soon be a bounty out on his head, Xi Ying ran to Rongji's home and confided in her what had just happened. Rongji's family overheard their discussion and were shocked that their most beloved and promising daughter was in a relationship with such a scumbag. And they were even more shocked when she turned her back on them and fled the city with Xi Ying to start a new life elsewhere. A life less Maid Marian and Robin Hood and more Bonnie and Clyde. Indeed, Psychologists believe that Rongji had developed hybristophilia, otherwise known as Bonnie and Clyde syndrome, a form of paraphilia where an individual is aroused by criminal behaviour. So just remember when you hear what she did next, that Rongji didn't choose a life of villainy because she was weak, or gullible, or even because she was blindly in love with Xi Ying. She did so because it turned her on. Now cut off from the triads, the couple found themselves in dire straits and desperate for cash, and so together they devised a get-rich-quick scheme. Rongji began working as a hostess in various seedy night spots, using the alias, Jin, and played the part of a married woman looking to have an affair. She would invite male clients back to her apartment for a night of fun, and, enchanted by her beauty, most of the monks accepted. Si Ying would then lock the door behind the client and play the role of Rongji's outraged husband. The client was then faced with a simple choice. Pay Zi Ying some hush money for trying to bed his wife, or face having his immoral activities exposed, something which could cost him his job, his reputation, and his marriage. Almost all of them agreed to pay. For months, Zi Ying and Rongji pulled their scam across China, travelling from city to city, renting apartments under different fake names, never staying in one location for too long, and netting between 70,000 and 80,000 yuan from each of their marks, about $10,000 US. It was the perfect crime. Well, except for one little detail. Each of their victims knew what they looked like, and should they ever be asked to pick them out from a police lineup, the jig would be up. That needed a change, and so the couple decided to make one little adjustment to their modus operandi. On the 28th of July, 1996, while working at a club called the Philharmonic in Nanchang, 
Rong Qi enticed one of her customers, a 35-year-old male named Xiong Qi Yi, back to her rented apartment, located down a dark and quiet alleyway. Xi Ying, who was hiding inside, secretly watched as the two entered, and couldn't help but notice the valuable jewellery that Qi Yi was wearing. A gold watch, gold rings, and a gold chain. It was then that Xi Ying attacked Qi Yi. Together, he and Rong Qi removed Qi Yi's clothes and confiscated his valuables. At knife point, Xi Ying demanded to know Qi Yi's address. Figuring it was best to simply comply, Qi Yi told him. Xi Ying thanked him for the information, and then garroted him using a sharp piece of wire. Rong Qi's eyes widened at the sight of Qi Yi struggling for his life, but they didn't widen from fear, but rather from excitement. The couple then set about slicing up the man's remains and packed them into four garbage bags. The duo made two trips to Qi Yi's apartment thereafter, the first to ensure the accuracy of the address, and the second to sever the phone line. That same night, they entered the apartment using the dead man's keys and found his 28-year-old wife, Shang Li, and their three-year-old daughter, Xiongling Xuan, asleep. Xi Ying woke them both up, and then hogtied them as he searched the apartment for valuables, leaving Rong Qi to guard their prisoners. Disturbingly, Xi Ying further tormented Shang Li and her daughter by showing them the bag containing Qi Yi's head. Xi Ying then strangled Shang Li and her daughter to death using his belt. Giggling with the rush of her first kills, Rongxi suggested setting the apartment ablaze to destroy any fingerprints they may have left behind. Xi Ying agreed, and in the early hours of July 29th, the couple escaped the burning building with 20,000 yuan, a little less than $3,000 US. Firefighters were summoned to the residence that same night. Inside, they found the smoldering remains of the mother and daughter. The bags containing Qi Yi were found two days later, after neighbours reported a foul odour emanating from a community dumpster. On July 29th, the Public Security Bureau of Nanchang initiated an investigation into the Xiong family's deaths. After tracing Qi Yi's steps that fateful night, they realised that he had last been seen at the Philharmonic, leaving with a young hostess named Jin. And Jin hadn't returned to work since. Working backwards, they were able to determine the hostess's true identity, and on August 18th, issued a wanted notice for Lao Rongqi and her unstable boyfriend, Ba Ziying. On October 10th, 1997, after a year of moving through eastern China and supporting themselves with their adultery scam, Ziying and Rongqi arrived in the city of Wenzhou. There, they targeted 22-year-old Lang Xiaocheng. Rongqi had befriended Xiaocheng at a KTV club, and upon noticing her Omega wristwatch, presumed her to be rich. That fateful day, they arrived at Xiaocheng's apartment, and after stepping through the door, threatened her with a blade and searched the place for valuables. However, they found little in terms of actual cash. Dissatisfied, they held the knife to Xiaocheng's throat and told her to call someone with a lot of money, or else. She chose to phone her boss, 29-year-old Liu Suqing. Over the phone, Xiao Chen pretended to be ill, and concerned for her employee, Su Qing rushed over to the apartment. An altruistic decision that would cost her everything. Once Su Qing arrived, Xi Ying tied her up and robbed her, but she too had little cash on her person. And so, while Xi Ying guarded the tied up women, Rongqi attempted to make withdrawals from both of their bank accounts. One of the tellers, who was familiar with what Su Qing looked like, immediately grew suspicious, but Rongqi assured her that she was just carrying out a favour for a friend. After successfully transferring Su Qing's savings of 25,750 yuan, Xi Ying strangled both hostages without hesitation. He and Rongqi then fled Wenzhou by coach that same day, taking with them both women's valuables, including their watches, purses, and phones. Hours later, Xiaochen's phone began ringing. Rongqi answered, and, unaware who was on the other end of the line, told the caller that Xiaochen was travelling with her boyfriend, 
that she had mistakenly left her phone behind and that she wouldn't be back for some time. The caller, named Lee, said that that didn't make any sense. He was Xiao Chen's boyfriend. Lee went to Xiao Chen's apartment that next day and found her door locked. He accessed her balcony through a neighbor's window and discovered the bodies of his girlfriend and her boss at the entrance, still bound with cable ties. The following week, detectives linked Fa Xi Ying to the crime through fingerprints found on the victim's clothing. In September 1998, Rong Ji enticed Liu Hua, an auto shop owner, back to her leased apartment in Changzhou. In a departure from their usual con, Xi Ying immediately attacked Hua as soon as he arrived, stabbing him in the chest. After subduing and binding Hua, Xi Ying rummaged through his pockets and stole 5,000 yuan and his car keys. He then ordered Hua to phone his wife, instructing her to deliver a ransom. Upon her arrival, Hua's wife was also restrained. Hua desperately begged for his wife's life. Do what you want with me, he cried. But let her live, I beg you. Rongji wanted to slay the two regardless, but seeing was strangely moved by Hua's love for his wife, and he decided to let the pair live, though not before extorting 70,000 yuan from them and stealing Hua's sports car, leaving them bound in the apartment for their neighbours to discover, terrified but alive. According to them, Xi Ying and Rongxi were remarkably calm and organised during the entire ordeal, and communicated mostly through eye contact, as if they could intuitively tell what the other was thinking. On June 21st, 1999, after spending yet another year traversing China, Rongji and Zi Ying settled in the eastern city of Hefei. They checked into separate hotels within the same district, and also rented an apartment in Xuanguan, Luyang district, which was to be the setting of their next job. On July 15th, Rongji, now working as a bargain in a neon-lit dance hall, encountered Yin Jianhua, a 35-year-old general manager at the Anjida Electronic Company. Jinhua was known for being a generous guy, always buying rounds for other patrons and lending money to friends in need. Again, figuring he must be well off, Rangji invited him back to her apartment. Upon stepping through the door though, Si Ying immediately pounced on Jianhua, and after getting the better of him, locked him in a small iron dog cage. Si Ying then gave Jianhua an ultimatum. Write a ransom note to his wife, demanding 300,000 yuan for his safe release, or die. Jianhua, a braver man than most, refused to play ball. He simply didn't believe that Xi Ying would follow through with his threat. This angered Xi Ying, who continued to bark orders at his caged victim, but Jianhua refused to comply. And so, to calm her enraged lover, Rongxi suggested that they demonstrate just how serious they were. After trying and failing to contact their landlord, Rongqi instead called up Lu Zhongming, a 33-year-old repairman who lived nearby, and asked him to come to the apartment to fix a broken window. Upon his arrival, Xi Ying attacked Zhongming and dragged him into the bathroom, where he struck him 20 times with an axe. Still trapped in his metal prison, Jianhua could hear Zhongming's screams coming from the other side of the wall. Xi Ying then casually walked back into the living room and threw Zhang Ming's head on the ground in front of the dog cage. There was no need for words. While Rong Xi stuffed the repairman into a freezer which he had bought specifically to store bodies, Jianhua wrote a ransom note to his wife, instructing her to meet at a specific location with 300,000 yuan. Rong Xi casually told him to end the note with the line, I'll be dead for a penny less. Due to a misunderstanding though, the wife missed the initial ransom exchange. As such, a second exchange was set up at the wife's home. Before the handover, Xi Ying cut the phone line before entering the apartment, this time wielding a firearm. While Xi Ying boasted about his past links, Jianhua's wife managed to secretly contact her manager using a pager and told him to contact law enforcement immediately. While waiting for help to arrive, the wife calmly asked Xi Ying if she could collect the ransom money from some nearby friends. She, of course, actually took the opportunity to escape. The police then surrounded the building, with snipers placed on nearby rooftops to prevent Xi Ying from escaping. 
A news team just so happened to be following one of the responding units that day, filming an episode of Police Window, a live TV show similar to Cops. They caught the entire standoff on film. While hiding behind a bed, Si Ying incoherently ranted at the officers outside, debating the value of human life and demanding that they bring him food. At one point, Si Ying shouted at the cameraman, Hey you there, holding the camera. You don't look like a tough guy. Do you find recording this funny? You might lose your life in a second. After three hours of negotiation, the authorities opted to pump the apartment full of tear gas. This prompted Si Ying to open fire. The officers reciprocated. Si Ying was hit in the right thigh, was subsequently pinned down, and was captured alive at 11pm. During his interrogation, he refused to give up the location of his partner in crime, Rong Qi, who was, at that very time, guarding Jianhua. When asked where she was, Si Ying flat out denied knowing her, buying her plenty of time to cover her tracks and escape the city. On July 27th, investigators were summoned to a residential complex. A landlord had just discovered two bodies inside one of his apartments, both of them stuffed inside a freezer. They were the remains of the caged victim, Jianhua, and the repairman, Zhang Ming. That landlord would later learn that if he had answered the phone on June 21st, he would have been the one summoned to the apartment instead of Zhang Ming, and it would have been him used to demonstrate Si Ying's willingness to kill. As for Jianhua, Rongxi had taken his life after Zi Ying didn't return to the apartment. On a table, written in Rongxi's handwriting, was a note. One which simply read, Honey, I'll wait for you at home. I love you. Still under interrogation, detectives informed Zi Ying that they had found Jianhua's body, and that they knew Rongxi was his accomplice. Xi Ying continued to deny knowing any woman named Rong Xi, and claimed that he had killed Jianhua himself. Strange, as according to experts, Jianhua had perished while Xi Ying was in custody. He then claimed to have tied a rope around Jianhua's neck and attached it to a time mechanism, one which would strangle him after an allotted amount of time had elapsed. That seemed far-fetched, especially since no device was found in the apartment. Finally, Zi Ying said that he had ended Jian Wan's life, quote, whenever the prosecutor says I did. During his trial, Zi Ying tried to use his old Robin Hood defense, saying that he only slayed the rich to give money to the poor. The prosecution rightly pointed out that he had slaughtered a toddler and a working class repairman, and that although his other victims were generous and had prodigal spending habits, none of them were rich. In November 1999, Fa Ying was found guilty of seven counts of murder, and was sentenced to death. Less than one month later, on December 28th, he was publicly strapped to a chair, and a single shot was fired into the back of his head. He was 35 years old. While one half of the infamous duo had now met his end, the other, Rongji, had somehow managed to disappear without a trace. Despite being one of China's most wanted fugitives, there were no reported sightings of her anywhere. After escaping from Huafei, she eventually made it to a safe house in Chongxing, the home that she mentioned in her farewell note. It wasn't until January 2000, while watching a news broadcast, that she learned of Zi Ying's execution. Now realising that her beloved would never return, Rongqi left Chongqing for the city of Xiamen. While on the run, Rongqi stayed in various hostels, hotels and guest houses, working in pubs, doing odd jobs, and selling her body to support herself. Much of the money she earned was put towards plastic surgery to alter her face and make herself less recognisable. She made use of dozens of fake identities and worked hard to perfect different accents ultimately becoming a true chameleon. Eventually, her case disappeared from news broadcasts. Her face on billboards and wanted posters were replaced by those of other criminals. Soon, her name faded from everyone's lips. As time passed, she slowly began to let her guard down and started to lead a normal life, believing that she had finally outrun her past. 
but as she was about to learn, no one can outrun the future. By 2016, Rongxi was working as a barmaid in Xiamen, under the name Sherry. You can see her pictured here at a workplace Christmas party. All of her co-workers agreed that she was a fun and happy worker who made everyone feel at ease. In 2017, she moved on to a car dealership where she worked as a saleswoman. It was during this period that she entered into a new relationship with a man that she met at work. Little did her new partner and friends realise that her entire identity was merely a persona. In 2019, the PRC celebrated its 70th birthday. To mark the occasion, the government decided it wanted to spruce up the nation's image, and that included apprehending wanted fugitives. Thus, they launched Operation Cloud Sword, an initiative that would use new technology to bring criminals to justice. This included installing hundreds of millions of AI-powered cameras with face recognition capabilities throughout the Middle Kingdom, creating the largest and most sophisticated surveillance network in the world. These cameras can identify any of the nation's 1.4 billion residents in just three seconds. For Chinese citizens though, Operation Cloud Sword could well be renamed Operation Double-Edged Sword. On the one hand, this new technology will, inevitably, give Big Brother more control over their everyday lives, but on the other, it does mean that felons are far less likely to get away with their actions. And no case better exemplifies that than Rong Qi's. On November 27th, 2019, the cameras monitoring the Dongbei Kaitang Plaza in Xiamen came up with an unexpected match. One of the workers at the mall, a friendly, flirty and popular watch vendor, bore a strong resemblance to Lao Rongqi, the fugitive who had evaded capture for 23 years. To the human eye, there was perhaps a slight resemblance, but the cameras consistently reported a 97.33% match. Officers in plain clothes arrived at the mall the following day and asked the shopkeeper to come in for questioning. The woman claimed her name was Hong Ye Zhao and said that there must be some sort of mistake. Still, just to put their minds at ease, they escorted her back to the station. There, a DNA test confirmed that Hong Ye Zhao was, undoubtedly, the woman that they had been hunting for two decades, Lao Longqi. Having effectively hidden from the law for so long, Rongji had stopped worrying about being seen in public, even by surveillance cameras. She had heard about the new AI cameras being installed everywhere, but underestimated just how advanced they were. And so, when her boyfriend offered her a part-time job at his watch stall, she eagerly accepted. That same boyfriend stood by her side during the lead-up to her trial, and pledged to spend all of his money on her defence, believing that they really did have the wrong woman but he needn't have bothered. In the face of the DNA evidence, Rongxi confessed to being the maid Marion to Xi Ying's Robin Hood, or more aptly, the Bonnie to his Clyde. But she insisted that she had been an unwilling participant in his rampage and placed the entire blame on her long dead former boyfriend. In her words, Xi Ying had forced her to be his accomplice and threatened to slay her family if she didn't help him. If anything, she was the real victim. She had thought about escaping, of course, but didn't know where to go or who to ask for help. I didn't want to kill anyone, she told the court through floods of tears. I just wanted to live. Believe me, my screams were often louder than the victims. But a plethora of evidence, including phone records, CCTV footage, eyewitness testimonies, timeline discrepancies, contradictory statements and forensics, told a different story. That Rongqi was not only complicit in the slayings, but was, in all likelihood, a willing participant. That she was the one who had selected their marks. That she had egged Xi Ying on to commit more and more heinous acts. That she had killed Jianhua with her own hands, purely out of malice. And that she did all this, not because she was forced to, but because of hybristrophilia. Forensic psychologist Catherine Ramsland compiled a list of motives explaining why some women date and even marry serial killers. According to her, some believe they can change a criminal and make him a good person. Well, Rongxi never tried to do that. She actively encouraged Xi Ying's nefarious ways. Some hope to gain public attention and become infamous. 
Rongji had spent 23 years trying to escape the law, so it wasn't that either. Some are apparently unable to find love in normal ways. Before meeting Si Ying, Rongji was living a completely normal life and could have easily found a well-adjusted partner. So again, no dice. And some desire to live out a fantasy in which they're dating the perfect boyfriend. That sounds more like it. Psychologists for the prosecution argued that Rongji had fallen for a man she considered an alpha male, even though she knew he was a morally reprehensible person, and she was only crying because it was finally time to answer for her past actions. In response, all Rongji could do was apologise to the families of her victims, including Zhu Dahong, the widow of repairman Shong Ming. Xu Dahong was left to single-handedly raise their three children and provide for five other family members, including Xiong Ming's mother, who, overwhelmed by grief, had reportedly cried so much that she went blind. Rongqi also apologised to her own boyfriend, not only for lying to him, but for allowing him to spend all of his money on her legal defence. Though she didn't have any money to compensate the people that she had wronged, she offered to start a GoFundMe in their names. That should make them all square, right? Not quite, Rongji. On September 9th, 2021, the court found Lao Rongji guilty of serial homicide. She was given the same sentence as her former accomplice, Si Ying. The Supreme People's Court upheld her sentence after an appeal on August 18th, 2022. Following that, Rongji was allowed to see her family one last time before her demise the family she hadn't spoken to in 23 years. Trembling, she apologised for everything that she had done, asked them to pay back the 200 yuan that she owed her boyfriend's mother, and prayed that no future members of the Lao family ever ended up like her. On Monday, December 18th, 2023, Rongqi's life was ended by a lethal injection. She was 49 years old and so ended one of the most chilling partnerships in modern history, that of China's Bonnie and Clyde. So, was there some truth in Rongqi's defence, that Si Ying had threatened and coerced her? Hmm, maybe some. He was an extremely cold-hearted guy after all. But she was an adult, capable of making her own choices, and she not only chose to avoid contacting the authorities, but also chose to evade them for decades. I'd also wager that Si Ying did care about Rongji. After all, he never once turned her over to save his own skin. But I'd love to hear what you think about this case. Was Rongji telling the truth? And even if she was, should she have received a lesser punishment given her actions? Also, what do you think about the AI surveillance? Is it a mass invasion of privacy? Or are you willing to be catalogued if it makes society safer? I'm sure that's a question most of our countries will be grappling with in due course. But with AI cameras, familial DNA advancements, and other new investigative methods, in our brave new future, the perfect crime is quickly becoming a thing of the past. A huge thank you to Robin for making the thumbnail. Make sure to check him out via the links below. Also, a massive thank you to my followers on Patreon and YouTube, especially my biggest supporters. Elizabeth, Nicole Beshia, Hamish K, Ellen Doloff, Itai Allon, Nefes1988, Lydia Cumo, George Lopez, Holly Lyons, Modest Bulbasaur, Alana Pons, Asia Mina, Azriel Warakai, Chief Kochuake, Colin Monsma, Connor Lothan, Sai Wazau, Farewell Tattoos Jack Seffel, Gina Valera, Hamish, Ian Bellock, Kevin Veer, Monica Mendoza, Peter Logdraj, Smiling Jack, Terry Ford, and TNS Mum. Thank you so much for your continued support.